Welcome to your Chapter 11 AP Statistics video. I think we'll be able to get this lesson done in just one video. I might be wrong, I might have to stop, but I think we should be able to do it. Um, chapter 11, we are going to be talking about understanding randomness. Why be random? What is it about chance outcomes being random that makes random selection seem fair? Two things. Nobody can guess the outcome before it happens, and when we want things to be fair, usually some underlying set of outcomes will be equally likely, although in many games, some combinations of outcomes are more likely than others. For example, um, pick heads or tails, flip a fair coin, does the outcome ma match your choice? So go ahead, pick heads or tails, stop the video, go get a coin, flip it, Okay, so did the outcome match your choice? Did you know before flipping the coin whether or not it would match? No, you didn't. So um, that is an example of random behavior. Statisticians don't think of randomness as the annoying tendency of things to be unpredictable or, hap or haphazard. Statisticians use randomness as a tool, but truly random values are surprisingly hard to get. It's surprisingly difficult to generate random values, even when they're equally likely. Computers have become a popular way to generate random numbers. Even though they often do much better than humans, computers can't generate truly random numbers either. Since computers follow programs, the random numbers we get from the computers are really pseudo-random. Fortunately, pseudo-random values are good enough for most purposes. There are ways to generate random numbers so that they are both equally likely and truly random. The best ways we know to generate data that give a fair and accurate picture of the world rely on randomness. And the ways in which we draw conclusions from those data depend on the randomness too. So one of the ways that you can generate um, random numbers so that they're equally likely and truly random is to take identical pieces of paper and put the digits 0 through 9 on 10 different little slips of paper and um, put them in a hat or some other container and mix them up well, draw out one digit, write it down, put it back in, mix again, without looking, draw one out, write it down, put it back in, mix again. But to get a significant number of random um, numbers, that would take a long time, but that is a way to, to get, uh, get random numbers that are both equally likely and truly random. Okay, practical randomness. We need an imitation of a real process so we can manipulate and control it. Um, sometimes it's just because we can't af afford to actually wait for the real process either with money or time. Okay, we need to speed things up or it's just expensive or maybe it's dangerous. So in short, we're going to simulate reality. All right, so we're going to talk about simulations today. So here's just a few vocabulary terms that we need to get out of the way, and then we're going to talk about the steps to a simulation. The sequence of events we want to investigate is called a trial. Okay, so that, that is one sequence of events is a trial. The basic building block of a simulation is called a component. So you may have several components that combine together to make a trial. Uh, like it says on the next little bullet point, trials usually involve several components. After the trial, we record what happens, and that's our response variable. Okay, whatever we're interested in, um, that's going to be our response variable, and we have to make note of that. Okay, so seven steps to simulation. One is identify the component to be repeated. That is the little baby tiny bit of a trial. And explain how you will model the component's outcome. Generally, this is going to be some sort of assignment of digits. Explain how you will combine the co components to model a trial. A trial or run, you'll hear that expression used also, is the sequence of events we are pretending takes place. Step four, state clearly what the response variable is. Step five, run several trials. If the number of trials is not specified, then run 10. Give the results of one run as an example. Now, if we really were doing simulations for some sort of real-world answer to a question, then we would want to do many more than 10 trials. Okay, We might want to do you know, 50 or even 100 because we would want to have a, a quite an accurate 
probability at the end. We'd want to know, you know, how likely something is. And the more trials we run, the more accurate our estimation of that probability will be. But for us, um, running 10 trials will give us a rough estimate of whatever we're looking for, whether it's a probability or the number of something, and uh, it won't take you too long to just get through one problem. Then you want to collect and analyze or summarize the results of all the trials in a table or graph of the response variable, and then finally state your conclusion, as always, in the context of the problem. So what can go wrong? Don't overstate your case. Beware of confusing what really happens with what a simulation suggests might happen. Okay, we really are just doing simulations. We're not actually watching what happens in reality. Model outcome chances accurately. A common mistake in constructing a simulation is to adopt a strategy that may appear to produce the right kind of results. Um, so make sure that what you're doing actually models the outcome, uh, the outcome chances accurately. Don't just do something that um, you think is going to give you the right end results. You want to make sure that you are looking at the components and actually assigning digits based on the likelihood of the components themselves. Run enough trials. Simulation is cheap and fairly easy to do. Like I said, for the, for the academic purposes in this classroom, if it doesn't say, then just run 10. But in real life, if you were really trying to simulate something, you'd probably program a computer to be able to do it, and you could run 100 trials instantaneously. Um, so if you want to run through the what have we learned, you know, we've learned to harness the power of randomness. We've learned that simulation can help us invest a uh, investigate a question that we can't or don't want to collect data on. Um, we can base our simulation on random values generated by a computer or by a randomizing device or found on the Internet. You can use the digit of random, uh, the digit of random tables. That's funny. The table of random digits in the back of your book or the one that I've provided for you. Um, simulations can provide us with useful insights about the real world, but they don't tell us what, the, what actually happens in the real world. They're just an estimate, and you need to keep that in mind. Okay, so for example, suppose the cereal company places one of four toys in every box of cereal. Furthermore, the company claims that each toy is produced in the same quantity, so each of the toys is equally likely to show up in a randomly chosen box. Suppose I want to get all four toys, but it takes me 15 boxes to find each of the four. Is this evidence that the toys are not uniformly distributed? Estimate the probability that it takes 15 or more boxes to get all four toys, assuming that the company is telling the truth. Okay, and the truth that we're referring to here is that they're, that each of the toys is equally likely because they have been produced in equal quantity. All right, so here we've got our things um, that we need to do, our steps there. I've got little reminders of, of each step. So the component to be repeated is going to be opening a box of cereal and identifying the toy. That would be if what we were actually doing, uh, if we were actually doing this in reality, that's what we would be doing. Okay, so here's our model. Since each of the four toys is equally likely, we will use random integer one through four to simulate an outcome. One will represent toy one, two will represent toy two, three will represent toy three, and four will represent toy four. So a trial we will keep we will continue to generate individual random integers until each digit one through four inclusive so we're including one and four is generated keeping track of the number of integers generated this will represent opening boxes of cereal until we find at least one of each toy response variable we will count the total number of integers generated in order to produce each digit one through four at least once so that is our simulation of um, counting the number of cereal boxes that have to be opened until we have one of each toy. So example, providing an example of our outcome, 13122134 would have a result of 8. Okay, because that represents 8 different boxes and it was on that 8th box that we found that final toy, toy 4, that we needed to complete our collection. So here's our results in a dot plot. I actually did do this um, 10 times 
and there's a picture of my results. And so my conclusion, and if you'll notice, 8 was the largest number that I, I had as far as numbers of boxes needed. I had some where I opened up four boxes and I had each of the different toys. So my answers varied from 4 to 8. The probability that it takes 15 boxes to get all four toys is approximately zero because I that occurred zero times out of 10 trials for me. It appears that the company could be lying, but we should conduct more trials before, before making such accusations. Okay, really 10 is not that many. If I wanted to conduct 100 trials, then maybe I'd have a better idea. Okay, guys, like I said, short lesson. Uh, we will practice doing several different simulations in class next class period. I look forward to seeing you then. Y'all have a great day.